I'm happy to introduce Dirk Smits from Icometrics. Dirk completed his PhD in um, medical imaging computing, and he has now a leading role at Icometrics as CTO. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Icometrics is a company based in Leuven, and with a US office in Chicago as well, and it's global es expert in brain imaging solutions of artificial intelligence. Uh, today he will talk about open science in the context of uh, companies, intellectual property, and collaborative research between academia and industry. Thank you so much, Vincenzo. So basically, I understand I'm kind of a bit the bad guy here, uh, taking the nice science that's all around there uh, and making a lot of money of that. Uh, before you judge me completely, let me uh, give the presentation and then uh, you can give it some further thoughts. Uh, so yeah, uh, just a bit, basically a bit about myself. Uh, as as uh, Vincenzo mentioned, I studied at the University of Leuven, did my PhD there uh, in medical imaging, uh, in uh, 3D shape modeling. I also had, do, did like a little bit of uh, business school. Uh, I was a researcher at the University of Antwerp, uh, working with MRI on small animals. And today I'm still uh, working as an expert for the European Commission in uh, reading proposals, especially on the, uh, on the valorization aspect, looking how science is uh, really going to the patients, mostly in, in, in case of, of, uh, of health technology. Uh, but uh, today I'm working most of my time for uh, Icometrics. I'm responsible there for a bit of business development, R&D, regulatory affairs, market access, marketing, sales and partnerships. So basically I'm the guy that's doing a little bit of everything but is not good in anything. But uh, hopefully that uh, is sufficient to give you a bit of an idea uh, on how uh, we approach open science, open innovation in the context of companies uh, and uh, also uh, show you how that is part of our current strategy. But before that, I first want to show you actually what Icometrics is doing. So you have also a bit of an idea of uh, who the company is and why actually we are, uh, why we are doing the things we do. So basically this is um, Roberto. Roberto is one of uh, my colleagues, also of, Robert, of Vincenzo, he's uh, doing his PhD at Icometrics, but unfortunately, uh, Roberto has multiple sclerosis. Uh, like uh, two, uh, two million people worldwide uh, suffer from multiple sclerosis, and this is a uh, number that is uh, increasing, unfortunately. And finding the right treatment for him, and with him I mean the MS patient, it's not uh, that easy. Uh, you need to know that in Europe, uh, on average, 14 drugs are clinically approved. Uh, and unfortunately, one in four is not working uh, for a patient when he starts on that treatment. So it's a big challenge for the neurologist in this case to find the right treatment for the right, for the right patient. Um, and, uh, yeah, this is also uh, complicated by the fact that it is a, a chronic disorder that is relatively slow, slowly evolving, so it takes some time before the doctor sees uh, the accumulation of symptoms that would, re that, that would requi <coughs> require treatment change. But luckily there are MRI scanners, so yeah, they're very happy for, uh, that can look inside the brain can also uh, have uh, uh, some parameters that can extract it from these scans that are more predictive on how the patient will be, will be doing. And it's exactly there that we as Icometrics want to play a role to provide the right drug to the right uh, patient at the right time by using the right monitoring tools. Uh, and that makes use of MRI, but not just the MRI machine, it also needs some post-processing software, and that is exactly what we're doing. Actually, you can compare it a little bit, uh, what we want to achieve with what happened with diabetes monitoring. There was a time that you can see on the right, unfortunately, luckily, I mean, it's long time back, but there was a time that uh, diabetes was diagnosed by a clinician by tasting and smelling urine, and based on that, he could know whether the patient has diagnosis. So that was a very subjective way of uh, diagnosing. And today there is even continuous blood glucose measuring. Um, and that is, uh, has changed a lot uh, the monitoring of diabetes patients and also made the treatment of these patients much, much better compared to 
uh, the um, subjective monitoring that has been happening in the past. If you look at the field of MRI, unfortunately, this is a, a report uh, that was taken from uh, the PAC system and translated uh, in English but, uh, from a, a Flemish university hospital. And unfortunately, uh, basically, um, the, the, uh, the report has not much changed since the very early report uh, that was first generated uh, in 1896 uh, for uh, an MRI of the kidneys. Of course, there's the, 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 the machines have become much better, uh, like MRI has a diagnostic capabilities that were not uh, even imaginable at that, that time, but the way of reporting is still uh, quite subjective. And we believe that um, by, uh, by adding some some measurements, we can improve that process. And just to give you a bit of uh, uh, a sense of why this is uh, important, here is a, a patient, an MS patient, uh, that is uh, followed up. And uh, basically, the MRI tells a lot on what's happening inside the brain of the patient. And you can see some, uh, some hyper uh, intensities on the scans. Uh, so you see it on the right uh, that, that the uh, hyper intensities have evolved a little bit. But it's now the radiologists that need to decide what's actually happened. Is it growing? Are there new lesions? Are, uh, are they enlarging? And this is very difficult. And you can imagine that a lot of, uh, lot of activity that is present inside the, the brain is just missed. So that's what we do. We have developed a software package called IcoBrain that tries to bring some objectivity there. Uh, basically, we try to do that for not only multiple sclerosis, but also for dementia, for traumatic brain injury, and for epilepsy. So basically, in the field of neuroradiology, uh, we are active. Um, and this is like an, an example of an output for an MS patient where you can see uh, also our uh, output of our software where the, uh, the lesions are color-coded by the software. And this is given to the radiologist so he can interpret the images in a faster and more objective way. Uh, and also the neurologist makes benefit of it because the neuro neurologist needs to make treatment decisions. And this is an example of uh, a patient, of two patients actually, where you can see on the top of the page the evolution of that patient clinically and also uh, with the, the drugs given to that patient. And on the bottom you see our quantitative reports and you can see that they are well predictive for these two uh, cases of how the, how the patient will evolve over the time. So just also to give you an, an idea that we're not uh, speaking about the, the world of medicine tomorrow, we're already uh, implementing it today. But that was just as a background that uh, companies also have uh, sometimes uh, purposes that really want to serve the patients and for that it is important and, in, and what I want to uh, discuss about today is how open science, open innovation play, plays a role in that aspect, how we uh, use that in our company but before that I first want to have like a bit of a general look on how uh, innovation uh, and open innovation is, uh, is implemented mostly in companies today. And I Unfortunately, I should say that uh, uh, it's difficult to, to say uh, in like one phrase what, what, how, how companies are, uh, are using open innovation, open science today, because there is not one strategy, there is not one size that, that fits all. And that actually depends also on the company's strategy. And this is maybe, let's say, the, the, the most business-oriented slide of my presentation, but it is also important to understand that different companies have different approaches at looking at science and innovation. Uh, basically, uh, according to business books, you have like, you can, can uh, classify companies in three categories, mostly. The operational excellence uh, companies think of Ryanair, for example, that really want to go to low lowest prices, uh, reduce all the unnecessary costs. And these are companies typically where you cannot expect a lot of innovation. They will take established innovations from other companies and try to source them in at a low cost. There's the customer intimacy strategy where you want to build close relationship with your end customers. You can think of it like consultancy companies. Basically, you, you, uh, you monetize actually the relationship with the customer. 
And then the last category are, especially in tech industry, uh, is the category that is, uh, is, is used the most as a strategy, and that is the product leadership uh, strategy. And in this strategy, innovation plays an important role. And what we see is that there is kind of a shift uh, over the last years in especially this category in how innovation uh, is happening. This is, a, a f this is a theory that was published by Chesbrough in 2003, is that uh, open innovation is taking in more and more uh, uh, the way, uh, it finding, finds more and more its way into the company strategies. And basically, uh, it's mostly visualized by these two graphs, uh, where uh, the company is responsible to take the research that's out there, uh, further uh, do some research on it and uh, make develop a product on it and go to a market. In the old model, it was a research project that were maybe been done at the university, but afterwards, all the research was done only at the at, at the company, and there was no let's say a connection with the outside world. Everything was kept secret and uh, and. and it was worked with a clear strategy, internal strategy, towards a specific market. And actually, more and more that it's changing towards a different uh, way of approaching it, seeing innovation as innovation of the whole ecosystem, the whole industry, and even across industries. Uh, as discussed earlier, Google is an example of that, uh, where some ideas are worked on, but are outsourced out of the company because the company needs a commercial focus, needs to focus on its market. And some ideas might be very valuable from the uh, technological point of view, but not of interest of that particular company. For those ideas, it's important that these ideas are outsourced out, for, uh, out of the company. And the other way ar around as well, like there are great ideas, great innovations outside the company, and open innovation tries to find ways to insource them. And in, uh, in medical imaging, uh, as, as also mentioned by Pim, this is, let's say, a field that is lagging a bit behind on, let's say, the consumer business, the consumer tech. It's a bit more um, like conservative. And I'll come to that later why, but this is because there is, a, there is a reason why innovation is a bit less open inside the medical imaging, although I think things are changing. But before that, open innovation has also an impact on IP. Uh, intellectual property is a, is a way to protect the ideas that you have uh, thought of. Uh, and uh, typically, it is, um, is filed as a patent to protect it. Uh, there are other ways of IP, like, uh, uh, like uh, model names, trademarks, um, software authorships, and so on. But basically, mostly uh, when I speak about I IP, I mean patents because that's, let's say, the, the in companies in tech, the most uh, Im uh, important element of the IP strategy. And, and here is a difference in, this, in, in the old model of closed innovation. IP was considered as a defensive mechanism to block competitors, to be able to, uh, for the company itself to operate freely. And so basically, it is seen as a negative right uh, to exclude others that others cannot do that innovation that you as a company are doing. But we are more and more moving into IP strategies where uh, patents are seen as a way to safely enter in R&D collaborations, R&D collaborations with exter external parties. Uh, with, for example, research institutes, with academia. And the other way around as well, academia, they can also generate IP and work uh, freely with, with, with companies to uh, work together uh, towards uh, like valorization in, in, in the market. Because today, products mostly doesn't, don't exist anymore of one single innovation. It's a combination uh, that is required to, let's say, uh, keep the, the fast pace of innovation that is happening today. So basically, unexploited IP is now considered to be an opportunity and uh, rather than a cost to account for. There's some interesting reading that was uh, also uh, published by the European Commission to also, let's say, promote somehow the advantages of open innovation and how to cope with that uh, IP-wise. Uh, this is, this is a, a slide with a lot of text, but 
I just wanted to quickly summarize the advantages and disadvantages uh, of open innovation versus closed innovation. The biggest advantage, in my opinion, is that uh, the innovations can go much faster because they can uh, make use of efforts from different uh, players in the field of innovation. So this leads to, let's say, a reduction of costs of the R&D and the cost you should uh, consider time as an important cost in a, in a company setting. Um, also, um, what is also nice is because you go, go faster and you involve external people in the innovation process, you can also take customers, potential customers, uh, uh, as part of this innovation um, project tra trajectory. And uh, from the company perspective, this is very interesting because you want to w build a business model that serves the need of customers. And if you only know after you have uh, developed your innovation whether the innovation will serve the needs of a customer, that might be very late because you ha might have invested a lot of time and money in building that innovation, whereas that might not be uh, like useful for, for, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the business or for the market. Um, on, as a disadvantage, uh, I would say, and that's still a, a, an important case, especially in the field of medical imaging, uh, there is the regulatory barriers. The regulations like FDA and CE, they say that as to the companies, you should control at all times the way you make your products, you make your innovations. And this control is seen as some uh, a safety and effectiveness of that uh, technology when you put it on the market. However, I think there are ways to cope with that. So it's not impossible, but it is another, an, another complexity that is added because uh, the regulators see uh, open software, open source software, for example, as uh, software of an unknown providence. That means it is not proven that it's working software, though probably it's the most reliable software that there is because many people work on it. There are testers from everywhere in the world that work on that software, but this is not how regulators look at it. Also, uh, from the IP perspective, you also give away parts of, of, the, of, of the, the way you cope with methods. Uh, so basically, your competitors know what your technology is doing, and they can play with that in their marketing. So they can have more information when they market their uh, products, especially when they are not open, uh, innovated, uh, not built in an open innovation culture. They can position their products against the products of the open innovator, uh, whereas they have the competitive advantage of having more information about the other, the other competitor than, uh, than themselves. Um, and just uh, as a last part, I want to like, uh, give you a sense of how we apply such aspects. And I think I Icometrics is not uh, a real open innovator, but definitely not a closed innovator. So we have aspects of both. Um, that how we apply it in, in uh, concretely in our in our company, and this is basically the product strategy that we have defined really from the start of Icometrics. Uh, so this is really literally from our uh, slide deck where we went uh, to the uh, went to, to the first investors with, and it still holds actually. So the idea that we had is that methods uh, that that we want to. Uh, solve applications for our customers. In the example that I gave before is we want to help a neurologist to treat MS patients better. That's what we call an application. But to, to uh, solve that application, we need a, a product, a software, and we call that a pipeline. That's a combination of different building blocks that serves a certain goal. For example, in the case of MS, we want, um, we want a pipeline that can measure the lesions inside the brain of an MRI scan. So we need uh, a pipeline for that. And the pipeline consists of modules, methods, uh, methods that are all around there, uh, uh, in, in, in especially the academic research, but also in the industrial research. Think of registration, think of machine learning algorithms, and most of them are um, easily available. Uh, it's also a lot of sh shared there via collaborative research. And it's also our opinion that that is not the purpose of Icometrics. We want to build 
on what has been done by universities, by, uh, by researchers all around the world to make use of these methods and to build pipelines with the perspective of solving a certain clinical need. And these pipelines, uh, our, our uh, view on that is that there is the focus from the regulatory point of view, also from our side, from the publication point of view, because one of the advantages of being open in the innovation is that you can uh, that that you publish and publish publishing has the disadvantage that you give away information about the methodology but it has the advantage that it gives trust to you, your 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 users your clinicians that use the software because they see it's peer reviewed that, that can that can mean something uh, and also uh, our patents are also focusing on on that middle layer so you can see that uh, that's where icometrics is focusing on uh, from uh, its point of view. Just to uh, go uh, one by one from the application level, as I explained earlier, we want to really help patients uh, via the neurologist, via a radiologist. Uh, for example, with MS, we want to make sure that the MS patient gets a better, better treatment uh, than he has today because uh, it's possible to measure uh, how he's doing and based on that, the neurologist could make better treatment decisions. Same ho of similar story holds for dementia. Today, it takes a long time before the first symptoms uh, of in dementia patients and uh, a final diagnosis, a firm diagnosis. And again, there, when you have measurements on the MRI where you can have objective parameters, uh, we believe, and we have also shown that, that the time to diagnosis has been decreased. So I think that's also uh, an important focus uh, uh, for, for dementia. For traumatic brain injury, patients come into the emergency department and uh, a lot of decisions need to be made. There is a, a brain trauma that happened to that patient uh, and there are po multiple outcomes are possible. And luckily, and that's the great thing, research in medical science has built a l great expertise but this expertise is not available for the neurosurgeon at the moment that the patient comes into the hospital because there are a lot of parameters that he cannot measure or he has not the time to measure uh, when the patient comes in. So that's what we, what we help with. We provide parameters that can allow the neurosurgeon, the neuroradiologist to make uh, faster decisions or whether to do his surgery or not. Also for epilepsy, we want to make the diagnosis better, especially for intractable epilepsy patients. These are patients that have not, um, that have not, uh, uh, cannot be controlled by by medication. So they need uh, surgery, but they need to. Then you then you need to find the source of the seizures, and we try to help them by uh, measuring subtle changes uh, that are difficult to see by the by the eye of the radiologist. So that's our top layer, the applications, and really that's where our marketing is mostly about. But below that we have built pipelines, and as you can see this is our pipeline for multiple sclerosis. Uh, it consists of, um, uh, if you are a bit of aware of, of image processing in MRI, it consists of blocks that are very well recognizable. If you would take the SPM package for example, or the FSL package, or uh, other packages, they probably have very similar methods in there. And also, we make use of uh, publicly available methods, like, for example, Nifty Reg and Nifty Seg, which were developed at the University College of London uh, for the segmentation and the registration of MRI images. So we make, we make use of that. And for example, for Nifty Seg, we also helped improving those algorithms and uh, uh, submitted them back to the GitHub where uh, they are uh, living. Um, so, but. And that's uh, a point where I want to focus on for a few moments now. It's, it is, um, let's say, a point of attention, uh, being the regulatory uh, embodiments, like you have in Europe, the notified bodies that give a CE mark to the software. And in the United States, you have the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, that needs to give its approval before the software can go on the market. And basically, they say, you need to have a quality management system in place. Say what? Uh, a quality management system is actually, and that's, uh, um, let's say, a very broad term that consists of 
organizational structures, responsibility, procedures, specifications, processes, and resources that work together to comply with the company's quality policy and meet the requirements of the customers and the applicable regulatory requirements. <laughs> so a lot of definition for saying that basically you need to control very much the way you make the software and you need to make sure that the software in the end or if it's other technology than software that the technology in general uh, meets with the requirements of the regulation and it's not only the result that counts like for example what would be the case in a, in a publication sometimes it's also the process how you come to that result that is uh, is of interest and there is something interesting this process oriented culture that, that happens a lot inside companies has some uh, some parallels with with uh, the open science and open innovation um, let's say uh, um, change in culture also in research uh, because the focus is not only on the results but more and more also in research the focus is how do you obtain these results are they reproducible these are things that are for companies are very important from the really beginning. As, as a company, we need to make sure that all the results pr uh, that the software provides, in our case, uh, can be reproduced for a period of five years. And five years might not seem long, but in terms of software, this is very, very long. Uh, so uh, this is um, something that we need to pay attention to. And just to give you a, a, a bit of a sense of what we do for that, to make sure that this is achievable, to control these processes. Uh, basically, this is a diagram that gives an idea that code is just, the program is not just consisting of code. No, the code is for, in our system, the way we do it, is, uh, is linked to design and architecture and individual design elements. And these are linked to requirements. And these, are, these requirements are linked to the needs of the user, uh, are linked to risks safety risks, uh, security risks, and are also uh, linked to regulations. So basically, if there is a regulation that says something, because everything is linked, I can point to that point of the code where uh, that regulation makes sense in the code. And this is in a way of traceability that is, for, for in this FDA CE process, very, very uh, important. And I think this is also something that is, I think, more and more coming into play when, um, when uh, in, in, in the context of open science and in open innovation. Just to give you an idea that we use also open source tools to control the coding environment. So we use Git, of course, to control a version. We need to have internal guidelines that our uh, code should be documented. We also peer review our code. That might seem a bit strange, uh, used to having uh, also the results being peer reviewed, now we also review the, the, the code uh, to get to the results just to avoid um, that, the, the, that there are mistakes in the code, but also to make sure that the code is written in a coherent way and is also uh, following the coding guidelines. As mentioned earlier, it's all linked to the requirements to the regulations. We dockerize it, so also the environment in which the, co the, the, the code is running is fixed and uh, is, 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 is well documented. And also, every part of the code, every single module is tested, and this test run uh, for some uh, units every hour, for others every, every day. Same with integration testing. Integration testing means that if you have built one module and you have built another module that should work together, you don't want that if you start developing on one that the other fails. So this is what the integration testi tests are testing. And they also run every, every night to make sure that this, uh, this is uh, uh, happening. What's also very interesting in the way we do it is that uh, we have automatic validation scripts. Every night, the whole code is, uh, is validated uh, against a very big database. Basically, you can see it as the output of a paper, uh, where you also have a table of the, the, the statistical results. We generate them every night, and uh, it's all automatically uploaded to our document management system. So that means that also the performance of our code is also, very, uh, uh, is also measured very closely. And this should, of course, ensure that we can uh, reproduce all the results in, in, f in, in five years' time. Uh, maybe due to the lack of time, we'll not discuss too much about the, uh, the interoperability. Another uh, reason what we see as the advantage of open 
open innovation, open science, is the uh, publication uh, focus uh, where we can generate trust as, as explained earlier to our potential customers. So that's why we try to publish all the methods that we have developed as open access uh, publications uh, that are peer reviewed, which uh, I think has a stronger value than what some companies in the closed uh, innovation world do is to write white papers. Of course, they are more colored there. Of course, patents are also important, as explained earlier, when you want to step into an R&D collaboration, you want to do that with, uh, with the, let's say, the right protection, and also uh, to look from the opportunity point of view rather than from the protection point of view. We work with uh, a lot of um, universities, uh, research institutes, via a very different um, European projects. So this is a a glimpse of the European projects, uh, the Horizon 2020 or FP7 projects that we are involved in. For us, it's a very uh, it's important to uh, help our innovation internally and the other way around as well, like things that cannot be valorized at Icometrics, that we can hopefully find someone that can valorize it into uh, into like the the market or the the, the end goal, the the patient. We also make our, some of our methods uh, open source. Uh, we have a GitHub repository, like probably most of you have, but also as, as, I, as Icometrics, we have chosen to do so uh, to speed up the development and uh, also to give back uh, some of the things uh, to the community. Because, for example, for MRI, uh, the DICOM to Nifty, which was explained earlier, is not is not always an op uh, a, a super solved problem. So there are many toolboxes there. Uh, if you're looking for one that works uh, command line or in Python, feel free to use uh, the one from that uh, that was initiated at Icometrics. Uh, we also, uh, if you get a problem, we support it. So uh, if you find data that you cannot convert, please just send to us and we try to, to uh, fix it uh, from the coding perspective. This is maybe especially interesting when you're uh, not really an MRI developer yourself. Uh, so things like, for example, gantry tilted uh, CT images are uh, not supported by many toolboxes. So that might be very interesting. So please, always welcome to go there. Just I want to conclude here that uh, also uh, from the comp company perspective, I think uh, you can go faster. You can see uh, further if you stand on the shoulders of giants. And with the giants, I mean, of course, the whole scientific community, the whole research community. I think uh, together uh, we can really make a difference for the patients. I think companies have definitely a role to play there. And I think uh, hope it can could convince you kind of a little bit that also comp companies are not only the bad guys, but also have some good purposes there. So... Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. Actually, I agree with you that we need more Europe-based companies to for for digital medicine and not only give F all the work to Google, Amazon hmm. and Apple uh, because I think uh, e companies that are based in Europe will probably be more conscious of data protection issues and other things. Um, I have two questions. Um, first one is, um, so you are building your methods from open methods from research and I was wondering which one, so what methods will be able to use from you and what methods we will not be able to use from you? Because you have patents, but you also have open methods. And I have not understood which ones would be open and which ones would be closed. Yeah, uh, that's, that's a good question from our perspective. And that's just also our product strategy that we have defined, that we want to be open on the lower part uh, individual building blocks, uh, but the pipelines, we see that as our, our core com expertise or also our USP. So, of course, somehow we need to protect that because otherwise other uh, people can just uh, start and doing the same. So from that perspective, this is patented and this is not uh, put open source. Whereas for the method side, we contribute to the community by just 
uh, taking the methods that exist and improving them or by uh, by giving back some basic uh, basic tools that we have developed internally. Thank you. So you said that the special thing you're doing is taking these methods and assembling them into pipelines. Yeah. If you incorporate a new method or a refinement of a method wholesale into one of your pipelines, is there a mechanism for rewarding the person who improved the method? Does that need to be done? Uh, it's, it, it depends, of course, on the license. Then. Um, that's one thing. Second, I think also uh, there is, from our side, the reward in the sense that we publish uh, about the methods, and we of course cite the uh, the the papers that were uh, based on on the on the methods that were developed by the by the scientific community, and I think that is very similar as how how a clinical researcher or a researcher that uh, would do it the same way. He also builds further on existing toolboxes, and he uh, either he gives back. Uh, code what we also do uh, by improving the methods or uh, sites uh, the work in, in papers and so on. Yeah, thanks uh, for a nice talk. I was wondering about your, your testing framework. Uh, do, do you also make parts of that available or do you also consider that more of the, uh, the competitive edge? Yeah, um, Neither of the two. I think it's just very impractical to make it available in the sense that it is very tailored to the infrastructure in which we work. Uh, but basically, some of the tools are available. Just to give the name a few, Jenkins is a is a tool that automates processes. So this is a tool that everyone can use. And in these uh, in these Jenkins tools, we run our validation scripts. And this is something, of course, that's not so much uh, intelligence. Of course, the, val the validation scripts are very specific to a problem. And then there is this automatic uploading to our document management system, but that is, of course, very dependent on our document management system, which is Confluence, which is also uh, this is not an open source tool. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a tool from a company f called Atlassian. So I think it's difficult to... To, to say it's generalizable, that uh, that automatic validation framework. Okay, you say it's hard to share. But yeah, yeah. Thank sure. you. Hi. Um, so maybe this is going to be one of the better examples of what I'm going to give. For, for example, for the MP2Rage method, hmm. uh, that started as an open repo on GitHub, and then this was adopted by a company, and then now, if you'd like to, for example, use some of its parts, you cannot use it freely. Mm. So what would prevent the developer of that method from you know, not being able to use your own tool after it's some, somewhat adopted by a company? Yeah. And then the second one is that like, we, we, we are also developing some open source tools, and one of them were used by a company that we didn't even know. And the file and function names were changed. We had a license and everything on the repo. Despite that, we run into issues like that. So what do you think is the most effective way for open software developers to prevent from such things happening? So does it have to do with the approach of the company? Does that really matter? Or is it that the license matters to you know safeguard? Yeah, I think the license matters definitely from the, let's say, formal way. So if, if a company is, is not following the license, in theory, you could sue them. Basically, that's maybe not uh, your, your uh, preferred way of doing it. But that same holds with the whole society. You have always uh, people that misuse, uh, let's say, the, the laws and regulations that there are. Um, I think um, you might be also consider it from this way that companies that are, let's say, following the rules part of in a, in open innovation culture, they uh, also want to protect to the closed innovators. Uh, so somehow maybe you can find some allies there. Uh, to get to back to your first question on the MP2 rage, yeah, that for, for me that sounds like that the license was not well defined or the license was, uh, it was already property of, the, of the, that company. That company sounds also like a closed innovator company to me. Uh, so basically, yeah, that's, it's difficult to, to, to judge that situation because there are so many unknowns that, that 
I don't know. Yeah, uh, interesting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering, um, you've shown your pipelines and you go to Nifty at some point. Uh, this Nifty Seg and Nifty Reg. Oh yeah. but, uh, when I talked about this traceability of data in a PAX environment, how do you yeah. do this? How do you get back to the PAX or do you stay outside of the PAX system? No, we go, uh, we integrate in the PAX system because indeed we work in a clinical environment, so we should follow the clinical uh, standards. In our case, that's DICOM, that's HL7. Uh, that's, that's, these are the standards used, not Nifty. So basically what we do is the DICOM images come to, to uh, the Icometrics software. In the Icometrics software, it's converted with uh, the tool that is also open source to Nifty. Uh, and at the end, the results are converted back to, uh, to DICOM. Uh, taken the original DICOM images, taken the result nifties, and the uh, images are put there as secondary capture, so they can be nicely integrated again into the pack system. Yeah. So okay. So it's not a real DICOM image then. It's a secondary capture. Yes, it's a secondary yeah. capture or a DICOM SR so image. It, it, it follows. To be the missing link now for open source to get from nifty back to DICOM. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me see if we can also put that as part of the DICOM to Nifty package. So if there is a, uh, an interest there, we can definitely uh, look into that because we have done some work there. Uh, so if there would be interest from the community, I think it's something definitely uh, that we're interested to share as well. Oh, okay, nice, thanks. When you talk about your quality management system, does that apply to the pipelines? or also to the building blocks. So would you open the Nifty Sec and Nifty Reg and do the same quality management system in, in there or would you consider those as a black box? That's a very good question. So uh, basically the quality management system applies to the whole of Icometrics, to its employees and its, and its, uh, uh, its programmers and its code and its programs as, as such. Uh, for blocks like uh, uh, nifty seg and nifty reg uh, basically what you should do is you should validate them uh, if you want to keep them as a black box so that's uh, what we did in the beginning so we kept them as a black box we validated them uh, we have tests around them again same validation framework uh, and uh, but of course when changing it they become part of our own quality management system so the changes are then uh, controlled by our uh, quality management system whether they are given back to the uh, scientific community, that's independent from that, actually. So if you would see a more efficient collaboration between academic and commercial software, the academic should also do some more quality management system, which I think yeah, is better for academic software. <coughs> it's, it's difficult to um, implement a quality management system, definitely a certified quality management system uh, across academia. But what I think would definitely be useful is some good practices that help supporting this quality management system, like coding guidelines, like uh, like a proper way of, 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 of uh, code coverage is also something, make sure you have unit tests. That's not something particular for industry. Uh, everyone can build a unit test around uh, every piece of code to make sure that that code remains working even if you change it. So these practices, I would say, yes, if you of you, I mean you, the scientific community uh, uh, would consider that, that definitely helps the implementation into, let's say, products uh, in, inside a quality management system at the company. Hi. Hi. Um, have you tested your tools on... Um um, your um, lesion segmentation performance on tools like FSL Bianca or DeepMedic? Uh, yes, we have done so. So, for example, we have compared with DeepMedic. Uh, however, uh, this is we see that as our scientific work. This is not part of our FDA validation because FDA doesn't recognize DeepMedic as uh, a reference. Uh, so they look more either as established software or other, uh, and that's the main focus, other uh, clear tools. So our main validation looks at other clear tools 
and also manual segmentations, uh, which is more the focus of our uh, validation rather than comparing with the latest state of the art, uh, because that's not really the focus from the FDA point of view. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this very interesting talk. Um.